This episode is brought to you by Columbia Sportswear. It's snowing again, and that wind chill is killer. But you're not worried about that because you shop the Omni Heat Infinity Collection. It's warmth perfected with tiny gold dots that reflect your body heat inside and protect you from the cold outside. No snow or chilly temps can stop you now. Go out anyway. Shop the Omni Heat Infinity Collection now at Columbia.com slash infinity. In sports, the scoreboard doesn't tell the full story, but Netflix does. Stories about dads who happen to be world-class quarterbacks and a battle for the heart, soul, and direction of the multi-billion dollar business of F1. Whether you're a diehard fan or you're brand new, Netflix has the stories for every type of fan. You can watch these incredible sports stories like quarterback, F1 drive to survive, untold, and many more now on Netflix. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back up front when you use it to buy a new iPhone 15, AirPods, or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA member FDIC. Terms apply. City of Chronicles is a Bay of Chronicles production. If you, you want to do Inter and Apple, then go to Fiorentina, whatever you want. You're, you, you're just like, I'm willing to follow. All right, I'm going to do it. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the City of Chronicles podcast where we are right this second myself and me Riziki trying to pass the second Champions League draw in the space of just a few hours with recording right after <laughs> uh, UEFA finally got their uh, balls together and worked out which way around uh, they should be for the draw. We've got uh, Italian teams to getting some very different draws I suppose second time around and I'm going to jump straight into that with you Mina. Um, hi, by the way. Hello. Juventus went from Sporting Lisbon to Villarreal. Inter went from Ajax to Liverpool. Now, neither of those uh, are, are easy draws. Ajax playing brilliantly, but oof, that feels like um, an out of a frying pan into the fire situation, perhaps. Yeah, it's an interesting one because, I, I mean, everyone always sort of talks about Ajax as, you know, I mean, generally speaking, obviously their brand is not as big as Liverpool, but if you saw them this Champions League and their matches against Borussia Dortmund and just how capable and, and well versed they are in the style of play they are, it wasn't going to be an easy draw either way, you know. And Ajax, obviously, I, I always have nightmares about them. They knocked Juventus out. They knocked uh, Real Madrid out. We're not discussing Ajax. I've just realized this is a different pod and the whole point is in turn. Do, do, do you want like this is the alternate reality podcast this is the podcast which would we would have had if the draw had been the original draw before they as, yes. as everyone likes to say in Italy before they rotto le palle before they broke the balls that's what we would have had but instead we wound up with this draw and there's no Ajax in it not the Italian side anyway there's still Ajax in it no but there is obviously I look at this team and I think to myself I mean, it's freaking Liverpool, right? <laughs> they're probably the best team in Europe right now. I, I, I think they're better than Chelsea and I think they're better than Manchester City, you know? Um, I'm sure that other people will have different... Do you think they're better than Bayern, I suppose, is the next question on that? But look, that's a different, different conversation. I don't rate Bayern at all. I don't rate Bayern, to be honest with you, this season. I know that obviously they beat Barcelona, but frankly speaking, the local five-a-side can beat Barcelona this year, so... Good luck, Napoli. <laughs> um, we'll get on to that. We'll get on to that. <laughs> we'll get to that, yeah. But Liverpool, I know this sounds really crazy because I think you and I both agree on this because we we had it. We do have conversations with, before the show starts, you know. I was obviously very, very, very irritated with the way that people spoke about Milan after their loss to Liverpool. Um, everyone's going, this is the Milan of San, you know, Baresi and Maldini. Sorry, it's a lot of Scottish punditry that I was listening to at the time. <laughs> And I just thought to myself, <laughs> this is a different Milan side that doesn't have, you know, Maldini and Baresi. Maldini is a director. This is a team that has Junior Messias and like, you know, um, really great players, Brian Diaz and stuff, but certainly not of the level that what Milan was. So they can't be fighting against their own reputation as well as Liverpool. Like, give them a break. It's been seven years since they've been playing in this competition. Their average age is like 
13 other than the, 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 the attack, which is Latin at 40. So like, there's only so much. And so it's just to be, sit there and be like, how embarrassing for Serie A. Well, no, not really, because they are prioritizing Serie A. They're exhausted. They've got lots of en- energy. They have, they're sorry, spent a lot of energy trying to win all the matches they've done. And they can't do that. They are the fourth seed in the group of death, as it was labeled. They managed a great win against Atletico. They managed great game against Liverpool, scoring two goals, even when they started off so badly. Like, let's just give them a break a second. This is no reflection of Serie A. So I'm glad it's Inter because I'm, I'm, I feel like Inter is a great representative of the league. I do think they can do something special against Liverpool because I really fancy their midfield. Liverpool probably will win it just because, like I said, for me, they're the best team in Europe by far. It's obviously going to be interesting. I just really hope that the comp- like it live in to do us justice and show what Serie A is about. There's so many threads to pull out of what you've just been talking about, Mina. I mean, first of all, I feel like I want to say with Milan, yes, yeah, sure, Milan ended the group horribly, right? They did. And, and to, to not born better in that last game when they have no motivation, you can kill them for that, right? Mm. On the other hand, Milan should have beaten Atletico twice. They, 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 they're, they're victims of themselves. I'm not giving them a free pass for Kessier getting that red card against Atletico, but they still outplayed Atletico, conceded after playing on 10 men for more than half the match in what, like the 96th minute, the winner in that game. So that could have been a very different game. And actually away at Anfield, they were clearly inferior to Liverpool, but they also scored two goals, led for a while and had to be undone by something kind of magical from Mohamed Salah. So I'm not sort of okay, even with that part of the narrative, because I think it gets sort of focused on what happened yesterday, not literally yesterday, but you know what I mean? Like, you know, we're only interested in the most recent thing that happened rather than actually what's happened over the last few months. Milan are also right now playing much worse than they were a few months ago. And that's just ebbs and flows of a season. We're going to, well, we'll talk about that, but that happens over a season. Much like Chelsea is suffering now. Right, exactly. But Inter are a very, very different kettle of fish, certainly in the moment. Inter are playing the best football in Italy. They've shown, I think, pretty conclusively in this stretch, they have the best squad depth of any of the teams in the top uh, of Serie A. That matters. It's going to matter going forward. Of course it does. Um, I think at a time when some of these, not some of, almost all of the clubs who've been involved in the title race up to now seem to be on a downward trajectory into the only one on an upward trajectory, and they really are on an upward trajectory. And I'll say over and over again, I'm blue in the face, because of these ebbs and flows of a season, what matters is not how you're playing now, what matters is how you're playing in February. But I do believe that this Inter team have all the right pieces to be continuing to improve in what is their first season under a new manager going into the new year. So look, I think Inter can give Liverpool a really, really competitive tie if they play as they're capable of two legs. I think um, obviously there's things we can't know, like a January transfer window between now and then. But I think one of the things that is also just a little voice in the back of my head, and I've always hate myself a little bit when I fall into these cliches, because you're like, these are cliches, and I'm always fighting against the grand narratives of Italian football, which always end up painting Italians defensive and boring. But the one that I do a little bit believe in, <laughs> Italian <laughs> clubs have a habit of playing up or down to their opposition. It, ha- you know, it certainly goes to the national team. The national team has found oh, a, sort yeah. of a yeah. habit of playing down to the, the, the lesser standard oppositions and, and playing up to. Now, Ajax are not a lesser standard opposition, but I feel like when, when you draw against Ajax, yeah, Even though Ajax are playing brilliant football right now. Yes, it would be sold in Italy, Ajax, as, as a game the Italian team was expected to win. This will be sold even in Italy as a game that Inter should lose. And I think sometimes, mm, mm. sometimes the Italian clubs, that's actually what gets the best out of them. Now that's maybe a little bit too hocus pocus and, and good or bad vibes I'm going for there. But I don't know. I, I think this tie could be interesting. I really, really do. And I, I hope it will be. I hope Simone and Zaghi will. We'll knock them uh, together in time for that. What do you think about just quickly Juventus Villarreal and then we'll have a bigger conversation about Inter while we're, while we're on this? Yeah, you're right. Also because Inter can keep up with the tempo that I feel like Milan have dropped in, in recently. So hopefully yeah. on, at least on a tempo level, let's see in February what happens. Villarreal, I mean, this should never have been a tie because Atalanta should have gone through. That, that is a game that still irritates me so much because the way that Atalanta handled and navigated this Champions League group stage has really 
honestly, it's just bothered me a lot. Um, I love the way that they play their football. They're so much fun. But I mean, you can just you just can't be that open at the back. And it and you are starting to become a little predictable in the sense that Unai Emery didn't even need to be that particularly astute. He just packed the midfield. Um, and he kept saying, I was waiting for the rabbit in the hat. You know, I was waiting for this move that was going to show something. And Gasparini took too long to make the changes that he needed to make. And frankly speaking, the team really only woke up when they started realizing that they probably going to lose this and their defense for me is just irritating but it is Villarreal unfortunately for the Italians and frankly they're a team that just draw like pretty much every game and recently those draws have turned into losses um they are tactically astute but they struggle to score goals and yet they found so many against Atalanta you know um and so Personally speaking, I think, I mean, this should be in the bag for Juventus. If you're asking me between Allegri and, and, and obviously Unai Emery, then I will always choose Allegri. But I also want to say, like, there's a potential that they'll go into this match without half their players because I just haven't yet seen a full Juventus. So I don't know who the starting lineup is because everyone's pretty much always injured. So I, I don't know what to, to assume, but you would think of two things, right? Yeah. I mean, like, as I said before, um, <laughs> It feels like a long time for me from here to February because that January transfer window and Juventus in a normal year, I, I would look at how things have gone and think they're going to be quite active in the January transfer window. I don't know, but this investigation hanging over them, whether that's going to be true, we'll have to wait and see. But I think really like this is definitely in the territory of waiting to see if Max Allegri can do Max Allegri things between now and February because I'm not impressed with this team <laughs> right now. And look, they were supposed to beat um, Porto and Leon over the last years, and they didn't. So we'll see. But it wasn't Allegri. It wasn't Allegri, you're right. Um, but we, I, I do want to bring us back to Inter because um, this is the Serie A Chronicles, not the Champions League Chronicles podcast. And Mina, finally, yes. I say finally, it's still not even half of the season, but it, it sort of felt a long way off not long ago. Inter, top of the table. I know. <laughs> I'm probably the only Juve fan that's really pleased with all of this. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I just, there's just something about this inside that is just, I love them. I, re I really do. And I can't figure out what it is, but it is, it is actually Alexis Sanchez being you the just love that they're not coached by Conte. That's what you love by them. Yes, exactly. You just what love that Antonio Conte is the manager. And you know what really irritated me was reading the Gazette de los Port today. And I actually just tweeted it out before. When they said, today, we can say that they are equal to Antonio Conte's Inter, you know. So, i.e., they were pretty much gross before that and lower and inferior yeah. to Conte's Inter. But now we can say they're equal. Now, are you freaking joking me? They qualified for the Champions League. They're outscoring you. They're, they're, they're top of the league earlier than you are. Like, how is it possible that? Conte has such a like a voodoo charm of a Gazette de los Sport or something. I really don't know. But this is a, a really a beautiful side. And even against Real Madrid, it, that should never have resulted in a Madrid win. It should have been into all along. The chances they create, their strength, their overall balance, they have everything. They have unpredictability. They have technique. They're tactically well arranged. Their midfield is so strong. If they don't want to beat you with velvet feet, as they like to say, they will beat you with their stamina and physicality. They have everything. Really, they have everything. And they are, for me, like um, the most complete squad. I genuinely do not see, like even when, I, when we talk of the great sides like Manchester City, they have one great flaw, which is that you can counterattack them, you know, and then that, that's their weakness, let's say. But with Inter, I'm, I'm yet to really find what their weakness is because I don't, they just have a way of, of ruining you. And Chalonoglu, ever since the derby, we discussed this last week again, I, he is tremendous. They can hit you from set pieces. They can hit you from open goals. They can hit you through just a number of ways. I mean, the way he works, the way Brozovic works, the way, La, you know, Lautaro Martinez will. I just feel like we should probably give up on him in penalties for the second, you know, and maybe just like look at <laughs> Chalonoglu right now as being that guy and leave Lautaro to score the, the other goals, you know. But <laughs> there was also a point to be made that this is quite literally like a disgusting Cagliari. And the fact that Walter Mazzari still gets jobs is remarkable because, I mean, the way that they were playing, they had, what, 23% possession. And <laughs> what I think was so brilliant about this is that when they were like, oh, well, they were relying on, you know, 
proper, just, you know, old fashioned counter attacks. And I wanted to ask you, Nikki, is it <laughs> ripartenza mm. or contropiedi? <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you think Conte would call it? Are we talking about Cagliari? Cagliari have neither. They've just Cagliari. got defense. <laughs> they just got City in front of their own goal and, 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 and aiming no higher than that. Um, I, I, I hear that a, another broadcaster may have stolen a line from us earlier this season that, you know, Mazzari was trying to defend a 2-0 lead, 2-0, sorry, 2-0 um, <laughs> deficit in this game. Yeah, look, he's, um, he's uh, a manager who, look, he's, he's done, I, I'm going to wind back my Mazzari position for a second and say, look, he's done some good things in his past, right? He was in charge of Napoli for a period when they played some pretty good football with Cavani and Lavezzi and, and all of that, the pre sort of Sari, um recent peak, I guess. But his football's been dismal for a long time. And mm. they lost this game 4-0 to Inter. And the man of the match, maybe the man of the match, was Alessio Cragno, a goalkeeper who conceded four goals. So what does that tell you? It tells you that this was barely a football match. And um, I, I felt like, honestly, you know, I'm, I'm always here to be a hype woman for Serie A, Mina. I'm always here to sort of say when things are great. I thought this round of games was overall not the most interesting we've had this season. I thought there were a few games like this where you just thought there wasn't um, that much a sort of great drama. And I've been saying for a few weeks, there are unfortunately a category of teams at the bottom of the table this season who I think are really, really a long way behind. And Cagliari's in that category. Slernitana in that category and not coincidentally, they also got walloped 4 0 this weekend. Inter were never going to have um, a real challenge this weekend. So I think when we're talking about Inter this week, yeah, the fact they won 4 0 is not the deal. The deal is that they're winning every week and then they're top of the table. And that, yeah, there are still some things I can pick out from them if you want me to. I mean, you said what flaws do they have? Um, yeah, tell me. I think uh, the penalties thing, while we joke about it, they need to sort it out. Um, I think that it's one concern. It's like a background concern because he's done well in the competition before, but it bothers me that Lautaro didn't score in the Champions League group stage at all. It bothers me that in those games against Real Madrid, when they really needed a goal against that competi- in that competition against the big teams, they didn't find it. And as an immediate thought, just because this is since we last recorded, sometimes Barella needs to keep his you know, his, his head on basically and, and not be an idiot because he didn't need to get sent off in that game. Um, but overall, they're easily the best team in, in Italy, I think, in but terms of the end squad see, that you keep talking about. But Sorry, tactically, go, go, go do ahead. you see, I mean, just on, a, on, on, I think that the penalties thing is a, is a great shot because they have missed quite a few, you know, anti Marco missed one as well for them. But it, they have lots of goal scorers. They play different styles of football. So on a tactical mm-hmm. level, do you, I mean, if you are the opposition coach, is there sort of a blueprint that you can follow that would destroy them or think that it would at least trouble them? Because that's the one that I, I can't figure it out. Like I can figure out, like I thought Villarreal, what they did against Atalanta was so clever. I think it's so clever to do to, for you, but you just have to give them the ball and they don't know what to do with it. You know, for, for a lot of teams, it's either vertical, bullying, whatever it is. There's something that always terrifies them or annoys them. What is it with Inter? Because I just feel like they can pretty much deal with most situations. Yeah, it's an interesting question. And and now I'm thinking about like, you know, which, which team has actually got the better of them twice since Real Madrid. And I feel like in, in both occasions, perhaps what um, Inter have done is, is been drawn into feeling too comfortable at certain times. They've been drawn into feeling that they were able to sort of be in control of the game and then and then let it step away from them. And I think that they're an interesting team in there. And and Simone, Simone mm. Zag is an interesting coach because if you go back to his time at Lazio, very much a sort of counter-attacking style of play at Lazio, very much a, whether or not you want to call it Contrapiede or Ipatenza, that has a sort of style of quick break football and, and wanting teams to a certain extent to come on to you so that you can exploit the spaces that you've made by drawing them forward. And What's interesting about this Inter team is I think they don't rely on that at all. Like they're very comfortable. It's like yeah. you, was just sort of, you were just alluding to, they're very comfortable playing high up the pitch. And I think Chalanoglu mm. is such a big part of that. Chalanoglu is a revelation this season, honestly. And it's been really interesting <laughs> really hearing. Is. Honestly, and, and, you know, no sort of prior wisdom on my part. I, I thought it was a bad signing for them. Um, Me but too. It's, it's really I interesting. Compete, I, we said it. We spoke about it. On this podcast. But it's been really interesting to me listening to people talk about it and people saying, 
you know, there's all this skepticism about him in, in at Milan and, and at Milan and people calling him like an, an intermittent type of player. And then you listen to Inter's coaches and directors now and they're saying, well, the media always said that, but we spoke to Paolo Maldini. We spoke to the other directors there and none of them felt like that about him. So even, even sort of privately, these conversations that happened behind closed scenes, uh, there was clearly a very high estimation of him and, and he's earning it. And I think he's, I'm not saying this to diminish the other players there because because they're all of them are important, right? I think Barella's brilliant, despite what I said before. I think Brozovic is one of the most underrated players probably in all of Europe for how well he plays in that midfield. Yeah, absolutely. Um, clearly Lautaro is is, a, is an elite forward and becoming more and more, despite what I said about his Champions League record this season. But Chalinoglu is the difference. Chalinoglu is what's changed. So he's the secret ingredient that has just given them something more going forward, I think, than what they had before. Yeah, Chalinolu is definitely the man that is pushing that all together. But I also think that the way that they're playing their game right now allows for greater inclusivity from the whole squad. Like, this is what I meant about sophisticated and complex tactics in the sense that um, in the predecessor of this podcast, I used to talk about Conte's into being a little bit limited because in the sense that, and I, and then there was another coach that said this at the time, is that they have like a one trick that's really hard to stop, but it is sort of, you know, you know what they're going to do. You just can't stop it because they're so strong at it with Inter, but it was almost like, you know what they're going to do. This time I watched them and I, they have a solution for pretty much everything. And if it's not Lautaro Martinez shining, it's Edin Dzeko shining with his like quick feet and ability to work in some tight spaces. It's, it's Di Marco's energy. It's, um, I mean, this time it's Dumfries and, and, who would have said that? Who would have thought that? Lautaro, it's an interesting one because in my head I'm thinking if I could make it into like a team that could probably, I don't know, really, really take on the Champions League and be strong in it. Just imagine for a second, I do really like Lautaro Martinez. There is something about him and I can't put my finger on it and eventually I will, but that doesn't convince me wholeheartedly. And I don't know whether it's because he's emotional, because he still needs a little bit of, uh, Hand holding in a way that, for example, I mean, he needed Dukaku. I feel like he he's growing, and I feel this is a different season. And and obviously, it takes time, and he will. There is so much talent there that he can exploit. But I'm just saying, just imagine into head Blaovic. How much would that change things? Well, I mean, I think Blaovic would change a lot for lots of teams. And it's interesting that you should mention him, Mina. I, I don't know if there's things you want to still say about this Inter situation. I feel like. I'll be repeating myself, but if I do, and I did want to go next to Fiorentina. So if you're ready for that, um, let's talk about Vlaovic. Cause yeah, look, we probably um, end up talking a lot about biggest clubs very often on this podcast. And we're going to get to, the, to your Juventus and your Milans and your Napis as well. But two teams won 4-0 this week. One of them was Inter, the other one was Fiorentina, who have quietly, quietly risen all the way to fifth in the table. Dusan Vlaovic has now scored 15 goals. Um, which makes him the leading scorer in Serie A, 15 goals in 17 games. He's up to, I think, 32 in the calendar year, which is second only to Robert Lewandowski across Europe's big five leagues. And in fact, is only one shy of Cristiano Ronaldo's record that he set in Serie A for a calendar year. So that's the level we're talking about with Dusan Vlaovic right now. It's not just like, oh, here's a promising young player. We're talking about someone who is gunning with the very, very best of the best. I, I don't even know where I want to go from that meaning other than just to say, first of all, even though we've said it before, the kid is special. The kid is really, really special. Yeah. The kid is really, really special. I mean, and this, I mean, it, he was scoring lots of goals last season, but this year, it, it, and, it, and especially because, I mean, this was the reason he wanted to stay at Fiorentina was Italiano arrived and he started to watch what his ideas were and thought to himself, I really would like to work with this coach. And that is what convinced him to stay at Fiorentina and not push for, for a move. I mean, he admitted that in an interview. The way that they play their football, the way that they take risks at the back and push so far ahead and, and you know, offensively, allows him to have all these opportunities and he is literally the best man to have at the end of an opportunity right now in Italy. He is just somebody that you know will will score those goals. He's strong, he is determined, he's trying to prove himself. Yet it 
right now, I mean, this particular match against Salernitana, he wasn't the only man that was wonderful to watch. You know, obviously, I really liked Malé at the end, and and, and the, the, he got a goal because he was tremendous as well. Um, there is the Sotil and his perfect assist. There are others that are making this Fiorentina side so exciting. Also, because you know, like what what I wanted to say about Inter was just quickly was that the inclusivity of the tactics allows everyone to partake in the action. So it's not like you have to sacrifice so that Ashraf Hakimi takes the ball to Lukaku. It's no one is really sacrificing. Everyone's involved. So there's a lot more of a mental happiness and energy about it because you feel like who's going to score? Is it Alexis Sanchez? Is it this? Is it Correa? Is it... Everyone has been doing really very, very well. And I think it's a fun unit. And I think that's exactly what Fiorentina are. It's a fun unit where everyone can partake in the action. And yeah, obviously there are sacrifices to be made, especially on a defensive level. But when they get going and they find their groove, they are having fun, which makes it that much more fun to watch. Having said all that I've just said, and, and being a huge fan of Vincenzo Italiano, I'm not that convinced by them. <laughs> so there is still so much for me that I'm unsure of. They do take way too many risks at the back. This is Salernitana, much like when we were discussing into it is Cagliari. They are probably the two worst teams alongside Genoa right now in Serie A. And despite that, Salernitana had a good first half. And even when Colontuano, their coach, came up to say that, he's like, I know it sounds ridiculous, but I didn't think we were bad. <laughs> and... Mm-hmm. It is. It is about the Vlaoviches and your Sotis and everything. And Senna and Tana right now have so many problems, not just on the pitch but off the pitch as well. Obviously, they have to find a buyer, and and the whole thing has gone mad. But with Fiorentina, it is the risks. I do think that away from home, they're really not very good. I mean, and they do concede a lot of goals. So I'm not yet that convinced that this is the side that can maintain their current position in the league right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you completely about the, the match on, on Sunday. I think of all the games to evaluate Fiorentina on, this is not the one. Salernitana are very, very bad. And yet still we're not, um, as you said, completely out of that game in the first half. Um, I think there was things within the game that I, I would put out just quickly. You've spoken about this before, Mina, like um, the fact that Blavich is such like a um, a deliberate learner, like he really wants to get better. And that's the thing that he's working on. And and um, I thought it was really interesting because he scored two goals in this game. Um, the first one, I think, is the one that's more eye-catching because it's a, an across-his-body chip from out the edge of the box. And you think, wow, that's a really sort of finesse strike. That's something that not many footballers can do. And it's a really beautiful goal. The second goal was him a- attacking the front post off that cutback from Satil, which you talked about. Wonderful, wonderful work by Satil to set that up. Um, and afterwards, um, he ran over to celebrate immediately with Italiano. And then you get the backstory that comes out about this, which is that Italiano has been sort of talking to him for the last few weeks and working on him with training and specifically attacking those spaces. It's something that, that he felt like was maybe a little bit that he was missing in his game was that attacking the near post on those crosses. And it was the sort of type of ball that Fiorentina were creating and they weren't taking advantage of. And I think that's such a sort of important part of this story because we're going to talk about Vlahovic. I'm certain lots more in the coming months as a, a tr- an, an object of transfer activity, right? Like he's not going to be at Fiorentina forever. He's probably not going to be there past the end of the season. He might not even be there beyond the end of the January transfer window um, because all of the world is waking up right now to the fact that this is a superstar striker. But the reason that he wanted to stay this summer, exactly as you said, is because he wanted to work with an environment and a manager that he thought would help him get better. And Vincenzo Italiano and he seem to have this great rapport. And what I think is fascinating is even now, it's, it's not a huge number. I think these things get like overblown. But even now there is a section of the ultra fan base that isn't basically not forgiven Vlavic for not signing a new contract. They don't boo him necessarily, but they won't cheer him either. After the game, when the rest of the team went to celebrate under the Kudfa Fiasola, he didn't go. He went to do his own thing with a fan because he's kind of not welcome with a section of that, that ultra group. And, and yet, look, if he ends up firing them into the Champions League, which is not inconceivable, they're fifth right now, or even just into Europe, and then they get a big transfer fee for him. And this transfer fee is inflated more and more because he's 
absolutely bossing it right now. I mean, I know that his contract is running down, but the more goals he scores, the more money you can command from anyway. I feel like this is not necessarily such a horrible outcome for everybody. Like this is the way that everybody wins. Am I, am I wrong? No, I, I think it's worth trying to keep him as much as possible because they are going to be just a completely different side without this guy at the end of every scoring opportunity, just managing to convert, convert, convert. I mean, one of the reasons we spoke about, like, for example, Inter in the Champions League is that they didn't convert their many, many chances, you know, against your Real Madrid, for example. Juventus need about 15 chances a goal before they convert just the one, you know. And you you look around and you think to yourself, this is the most clinical of all strikers. And it's worth allowing him almost to you know, do whatever, but just stay because what he can provide and how much further they can push them, he can push the team onwards and potentially be in the top four is almost a move that I just wouldn't want to disturb right now. If they can just shore up defensively when they do and work better away from home, then this could be a team that really stuns us because their football is modern. It is interesting. It is fantastic. There is great team harmony. And like you said, even just when you listen to him talking about the, the Italiano in his interviews and he says, well, when he gets angry with me, I'm Dusan. But when he loves me, I'm loud, but you know, and it, <laughs> it's just, you can see how happy everyone is, you know, and except for the fans, obviously with him, but there, there has been yeah. talk of, of Rocco Comiso, like thinking of like, you know, should we just try to keep him? But I wonder how much money will come for him because right now, if I'm Fiorentina, I'm really not willing to negotiate any of my terms. I mean, it's got to be really big bucks. And frankly speaking, if Lukaku went for 150 and I'm not willing to sell Blaubich for 70. I need something closer to that figure. Yeah, I, I just don't think it's about money, this contract situation. He was offered five times what he's on. I don't think Vlahovic is holding out for more money. I think he's holding out because he knows. No, he's not. Whether it's this summer or, or later, he wants to go to one of the clubs that can win the Champions League, I think. And, and fair enough, if that's his ambition, or at least be in the Champions League consistently. I, I do think very possibly week to week, <laughs> It's looking to me more and more that I'm looking and thinking of where have Juventus missed their opportunity if they wanted this guy. We've talked about the fact that Juventus were, were yes. supposed to be one of the clubs that were very keen on him. I think the more I look at the way things are going, the more I think the the only clubs who are going to be able to offer what he's worth are going to be your Man City's, PSG's, your your clubs who really have the the really deep pockets. Because I think personally, even this summer with one year on his contract, someone's going to pay really big money for him, and I think they'll be probably not disappointed they did, even though um, it's one year left in his contract because a player, players this good don't come around all that often. So that's my take on that situation. But his will makes a difference. Yes, of course. I think his will makes a difference because Arsenal have come in obviously with a lot of money and he doesn't seem to want to go there. So I wonder what will happen and if Manchester City will make, well, I mean, Manchester City should really make a move if they can in January. And whether or not, you know, I mean, let's just say Fiorentina say we'd rather like give up on the money and keep you because you can get us into the top four. What will what will happen on his occasion, you know, on, on his level? Will will he say, no, I really want to go and you have to let me go? I wonder what his will is and where he wants to go, because I think that's gonna make all the difference. Yeah, and, and there's there's other things that like are, are interesting in this conversation. Like, look, he's just helped Serbia qualify for the World Cup. Will he prefer to stay at Fiorentina a bit longer just because he knows, look, I'm playing every week right now. I'm comfortable. I'm scoring goals. This looks yeah. best for me going into that. I don't know. Um, we did get a question from Stampa on Twitter saying, what happens to Fiorentina when Vlavic leaves? They do look better as a squad, but how do we evaluate them without a player like Dusan? Uh, my feeling on this, Mina, is from everything we've just said, they're going to be clearly, without question, materially much poorer up front. They're going to lose all those goals. He scored almost 50% of the goals this season. But the question you can't really answer until you know how they reinvest that money. They might get some players in, in the transfer window, either when he leaves or afterwards, which can help them build something more long-term. I think that actually it's, it's I mean, obviously they're going to lose something when you, any, any team is going to lose something when you lose a Blauvich or obviously a player of that ilk. but. They do. It looks like they are going to get Ikone from Lille, who just delivered two beautiful assists midweek in the Champions League against Wolfsburg. Um, he's a, he was he's fantastic. A former teammate of Mbappe. Yeah, I mean, he what a player, right? I mean, mm. obviously he's 
you know, don't expect Blau, which level. It's still like, you know, he's not always there. But I do like that his footballing might, and then he's, his quick thinking, he executes things very quickly. He's a winger, um, plays on, on the, on the in, wide, um, also can play in central positions. It's up to that. But that's somebody that is coming in. I mean, you know, he's been compared to a lot of people from Yori Jokaev to Frank Ribery. I mean, you know, take it with a pinch of salt, obviously. Um, but he is somebody who trains really well and is willing to learn. And I love that about players. But I do believe that this is a team that actually scouts pretty well. So I feel safe that they will keep finding great talent. They just need to get there before Borussia Dortmund. <laughs> Because if I was them, I would have tried to get Korea Madami and maybe position themselves in a way of, you know, the way the doormen are, you know, um, and try to get themselves these great talents and offer them the space, you know, because it's upsetting when I see someone like Salzburg, the Dami going to possibly Borussia Dortmund, whereas I feel like he could benefit a lot from moving to, to for example, Fiorentina and being their striker instead of Lauvich, right? Yeah, I think it's a great point. And I think maybe Vincenzo Italiano, you want him to become that coach who convinces you, convinces players, oh, I like this guy. And in fact, everything Vlahovic says publicly about how much he likes working with Italiano could help them in the long run. Because yeah, if it makes other young players go, oh, look what he did. Yeah. It's a, a good thing going forward. Seria Chronicles is excited to partner with Kalido Media, an Australian digital media agency specializing in website design and development and digital marketing. The Kalido Media team has a diverse range of digital skills, including helping our podcast by managing its social media accounts and editing videos for YouTube. Whether you're looking to enhance your website to attract new business or find an audience via social media marketing to generate leads and sales, Kalido Media will work with you to develop a customized digital strategy for your business. They've had a lot of success in generating leads and driving online traffic for various types of businesses, including home builders, renovators, and kitchen cabinetry professionals, commercial cleaning, and even tennis coaches. So if you're looking to attract new eyeballs to your business to generate leads and drive sales, visit kalidomedia.com.au to get in touch with the team to discuss a strategy to fire up your business, connect with your ideal audience and communicate your message. Fire up, connect and communicate with Kalido Media. See the link in the show notes. Mina. We've done our sunshine and rainbows teams this week, which is in <laughs> Tel and Fiorentina. We have a few teams who perhaps are not feeling quite so festive as we go from sunshine and rainbows to festive, which I don't typically associate with with um, with uh, sunshine. But you know what? We're just mixing our metaphors right now. It's fine. Um, teams that aren't feeling so positive going into uh, the the last bit before Christmas. Teams who are really starting to feel like they're losing all of the good they did in the first part of this season. Napoli with another loss, uh, this time at home to Empoli. I, I, I don't know, I mean, I mean, they didn't score and so it's easy to look and go, well, they lost Victor Osimhen and that's what this is all about. But actually up until this game, they've been scoring goals and conceding too many recently. So what's going on at Napoli? You tell me. It's interesting because we were talking, actually, we were talking about the Champions League. It didn't end up really talking about the fact that they drew Barcelona in the Europa mm. League, um, which should be interesting. And, and I think actually they've got a great chance judging by what Barcelona is doing in the league and, well, their performance against Bayern and, um, and Benfica. But I, I'm sorry. Um, I don't want to say like, this is why I don't trust Napoli, but it is kind of why I don't trust Napoli. You know, they are struggling with absences. They still bought on Lorenzo Insigne. He's not at his best. They had Ingrisa come on eventually. They did lose Zielinski um, because he felt like he couldn't breathe. And that was very early in the match. So unfortunately, that meant that Insigne had to come on very early and he wasn't yet, or they don't think yet he's got all those minutes in his legs. But you know, absences are part and parcel of this game, right? And Milan have had to cope through them, which is why I get really defensive of them when people are harsh, because it is having to deal without Captain Kaya. And that makes a difference for tomorrow's performances. They do have to deal without Calabria. 
they've had to rotate their midfield because there's only so much you can put on Kessier and Benacer and and Granati's taken over, thankfully, that the teams have had absences. Dybala is never available for Juventus, you know. So, and yet with Napoli, there is this feeling where absences is one thing, but there's this this mentality issue that I get with them, this way of just saying, okay, if we can't do it the way that we want to do it, if we're not having fun scoring the goals that we want to score, then I don't see anything from them that, that this wicked way of cynicism. The thing that I see in Inter, when you look at them, it's like, I come hello high water, we are going to score our goals. The things that we were, that were so famous of Juventus, who won nine in a row, it was, we won't necessarily entertain you, but we'll make damn sure we'll get the three points. And with this, I just kind of felt like it, it was a very Napoli game. And I, I don't know, because it's been like, you know, it's, it's obviously like a, a few things have started to go to go wrong with them. Obviously, we saw them suffer against Sassuolo. We saw them, you know, lose again. But yeah, I, I, I honestly don't know. But for me, it's always going to be Napoli is going to be a team that I don't believe in. And I think that's why, like, I really do hope they concentrate heavily on the Europa League because they're actually in with a great chance of winning this league. And I'm sure things will change when Osman comes up and they can reclaim that. But my issue is, is that when they fall, are they going to be very good at coming back up? Like, let's just say they do have a full squad now. Has their mentality been broken or not? Or can they really prove to me that they're a side that genuinely want to win trophies at every level and fight for everything? Because I've never been convinced of that. Not when they had Sari, not when they had Ancelotti, not when they had Mazzari. And I'm not convinced of it now under Spalletti. So... I, I honestly don't know, but I, I do did laugh at the way that Cotroni got that goal because, like, what a goal that was. So I'm, I'm going to throw out some qualifiers. Um, first of all, it was a good win over Leicester in midweek, and and I thought that was it was impressive. You know, with all the in- removals they've removed, the injuries, the absences they've got at the moment, they still let go of a two nil lead. They did, but they showed resilience and, and won the game, and they've actually sort of. Uh, I think in both games against Leicester City, I thought they played well and, and showed resilience. And in the first one, it was a sort of Victor Osman show that bailed them out. And and in this one, I think it's sort of impressive they do that even without Osman. I think I think there is some some real quality in this team that has not gone anywhere. And I think it's impressive that that quality is still there even with some of the players that they've lost. I think um, it's also worth saying that boring as it is. There is actually some quite solid evidence now that the Thursday, Sunday cycle for Europa League teams is damaging. Teams in the Europa League have across different leagues in, in different countries performed worse in the seasons they're in the Europa League. And that's a, a situation that is just, I suppose, a, a difficult one for any team that's got that Thursday, Sunday cycle. The the other thing, which is not specific to Napoli, but I, I'm going to say anyway, is me personally, I, I hate the way that Serie A have scheduled this season. And I look at the way that Napoli are going into Christmas, the way that Milan are going into Christmas, and the way that Atalanta blew their chance against Villarreal. And I think to myself, how is it that Serie A started later than the Premier League, but has played more games within the Premier League at this point of the season and seems to be trying to jam so much of the season into this last few weeks before Christmas? I think they have you're not giving them so many alibis. Come not, on. Not, not, this, this is not just about Napoli, this one. This is a bigger point that's, uh, that's been a bee in my bonnet for a little while. I, I'm frustrated with Serie A that in recent seasons has tried to do things to help its teams in Europe. And this one didn't affect Napoli in Europe, but it has affected, I would argue, perhaps Atlanta in Europe and, and Milan. I, 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 th- I don't understand the scheduling this season. I just don't. I don't understand why it's been done this way. It seems unnecessarily congested in this part of the year. All of that out of the way. I think I agree with you that there is something bothersome about the mental side of this Napoli team. Because in the end, could they have won this game against Empoli? Yeah, they, they probably should have done. And we should give some credit to Empoli as well, who are playing well at the moment. But, but Napoli still were kind of in that phase of the game where it felt like they were going to score when they conceded. It felt like they were sort of building up to something and they didn't. Likewise, they probably could, should have beaten Atlanta at home and they didn't. It feels like this team is finding ways to not win games that are a la loro portata, like that are within their sort of 
ability and their sort of position within a game to get the points from them. They're finding ways not to do it. And that is where I, I come to your point about the mentality of a side and, and whether it's something that has felt like it, um, it's just part of who they are for a while. And that's something that's hard to explain because of course it is different managers, different, um, well, not wholly different players, but some different players and, and certainly a different time and context. Um, so I don't feel like I fully have the answers to this Napoli team. All I would say is yes. Um, and I think there's a big difference where you can say, look, Inter, I've got the squad depth and we've talked about that. But if you look at the starting 11 that Napoli put out against Empoli, it's a very different starting 11 to the starting 11s that they had earlier in the season when they were really sort of bossing everything. It just is. There, there's a lot of players in that 11 that, that you don't think would be there. And sure, I would say to you, that's a great point. If you're facing Juventus, you're facing Empoli. So whatever starting 11 you mm. put on, it's not that going to be, you're not coming at games like wild beaters. Although I'm not, you know, when we talked about Inter and I said to you, like on a tactical level, what's the weakness? Is there a weakness? Is there something that I can honestly point to and say to myself, yeah, that really terrifies them. That scares them. Like I remember you, when I used to, to watch Bayern, I used to, everyone was like, oh, this Bayern, this trouble winning Bayern. And I just thought if you just run really fast at their defense, they panic. And, and no one ever did that. <laughs> and, and I watch Napoli and I think that if you, if you, if you try to restrict it to man or man jewels, they lose. Um, if you put them and expose them because they work as a unit, if they're not having fun in the way that they play the game, then they almost start to lose the desire to play the game. And that is on a mental level that annoys me. But from a tactical level, it is very, very quick feet because they're used to being the team that plays the technical level and really fast football. But if you bully them, if you harass them and you, and you, pat, you put them in a position where panic, they are not calm under pressure. And this is where, for me, I just feel like, it, you know, they, this is why Hellas Verona, for me, was like the perfect, as a Juve fan, the perfect opponent for them to have had on the last day of the season. Obviously, different coach and everything. But for me, it was like, because that is exactly the team that they were going to struggle against. Atalanta is exactly the team that they were going to struggle against. They may play really well. Technically, you may turn around to yourself and think they've created so many chances but they don't win it because there's a part of them that breaks down when they fat, when they, when they pose teams that are good on one-on-ones that do push and bully and harass you or teams that have very, very quick feet and are well tactically assembled. And this is what Empoli are. They, they made sure that they do, they did leave it to sometimes one-on-one situations. Um, I felt like they are very well adept at understanding what each individual task is and what each player is set to do. And they do have technical players. You know, Bedrami is wonderful to watch. For me, he's probably been their best player all season. Um, and I mean, obviously, you know, Pinamonte has had a lot of like people talking about him as well. But I mean, it's, it all rotates around that middle. And Andrea Zoli, you know, Spalletti so well. So he knows what his tricks are. He's probably better at neutralize them. So we have to understand that as well as that being something of an advantage. But my issue, again, with Napoli always stems from the fact that there are those tactical errors or or weaknesses that they have, which usually sometimes when you have physicality, let's say a, a one thing, or when you have a mentality, then that hopefully shifts the balance in your favor. But this is where I sometimes struggle in the sense that they can't cover up those mistakes. If they are being, being bullied, they don't rise to the occasion, they fall apart. And this is the thing that irritates me the most from them. And so I don't know because Osman really did change that. He's a guy that just is relentless up front. For me, he's the early leader. Like they talk about Koulibaly. I don't see Koulibaly as being a huge leader at the back. I just think he's a very, very good defender. But he's not somebody whose voice I think makes all the difference in the world. I think Osman is different. The way that he plays his football, it's like the man just does not give up. And that is something that they're really missing, not just from a physical point of view and obviously everything that he can provide on a level, on a technical level and defensive level, but also because of his mentality. When you see a player like that not give up, it helps you to not give up. I think Zielinski is great at that. And I do think it's a loss to have lost him in this match too, because sometimes I think he can sometimes rise to the occasion. But the rest, yeah, I don't know. Like I don't look at Lozano and think, yeah, you know, this guy really wants it. <laughs> you know, I, I don't look at, Unas or Almas or Mertens or Insignia or whoever, maybe Angrisa. And that was the difference. But 
the rest of the team for me is just decide that unless they get to play pretty, they don't want to play. Yeah, I think I disagree with you on Kudibali. I think Kudibali was playing really, really well this season. I think the drop off from Kudibali to, to Juan Jesus, no matter which way you slice it, is just massive. Um, and I think that's a really sort of because big of loss. I think it's level. interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, but I think there's also something, I understand where you're coming from about personality because I, I think Osimen brings that huge personality to the pitch and Kudibali is a slightly more um, a cold personality, I guess. He's not someone who's expressive in the same way. And I, I understand where you're coming from, but I think that his physicality is still a presence on the pitch that without that is, is missed quite a lot. I think he's quite, can be quite imposing for center forwards, um, to deal with. I think without question, Jelinski has been a leader of this team. So losing him is, is huge, but I don't know. Beyond that, I, I completely agree with you about Lozano. I think he's a player I've, I've always found quite <laughs> frustrating. And um, since he arrived at Napoli, capable of great mm. things, but I never feel like he's the one you want to lean on to grab a game by a scruff of its neck. Um, I think that uh, Dries Mertens is a tremendous footballer with with so much going for him, but in the same way, can get a bit lost in a game. I think it's interesting that actually in this game, Adam Unas, who very much is is quite far down the list of sort of players you expect to be in that starting eleven, he's I mean, it's might even his first start of the season in Serie A. And yet probably was their best player going forward. And that, that tells its own story. You know, even the players who were there, who are normally part of the starting group, didn't, didn't do as much as they could have done. Um, but uh, definitely the things slipping away from Napoli in a big way right now. And I suppose we would say the same thing about Milan, who were top of the table going into this round. Um, another draw away to Udinese. Barely got that draw. It was. Uh, a piece of magic, uh, an overhead kick from Ibrahimovic. Mina, the question is in my head. I don't know if you have an answer to it because I don't know if anyone does. How is this happening exactly like it did last season? They came out the block so fast last season and then they fell away over Christmas and it's maybe like a tiny bit earlier this year, but it feels like it's basically the same story repeating itself. Yeah. And this is the worrying thing, right? Um, I was really shocked to see so many fans being so angry with Milan. I mean, Milan fans who are writing like purely out and this team is weak. And I thought, I don't know if this is maybe because I was looking for it, just wanted to see what the reaction was from Milan fans. But I was a little bit like disappointed with how he's gone from like hero to zero in their eyes. But this was interesting. And, and the question posed to purely after the game was, do you think that tactically that you might have been found out? I mean, largely because I guess of the move that Udinese um, did, which was the ball from Benacea to Bakayoko. And they intercepted that because they knew that he would fall back and then try to pass forward and made sure that they, they won back that ball and then could try to go for goal. Um, and it looked like they had studied that pretty well because that's always kind of been what he's done. And obviously it was a mistake and Milan conceded yet again. Like defensively, they have lost something. And I wonder, um, they are a young squad, firstly. There is mental exhaustion in having to partake in the Champions League and then in all these matches. And I don't think that they, whereas I do think they have squad depth, at least they've been able to replace, you know, midfielders, not necessarily for better ones, because Bakayoko has been relatively hideous for them. Um, there isn't squad depth all over the pitch. And when you're constantly changing your team, there just comes a point when you all just start to suffer. So you could say that. But there's a part of me that just thinks this happens quite a bit sometimes to Pioli. And like you said, it happened last season. It's happened before with Fiorentina. I wonder um, if there is just something there that it, it, I, you know, we're not yet sure of what it is that, you know, but they are without Rebic. They are without Leal. They are sort of a little bit dependent on Zlatan Ibrahimovic. It is kind of always all on Kessie, Kessie and Tonali. And I do think that when you take Cagliari away and their captain and, and you Tomori is not the same player, right? And then there's no Calabria. It's, it's a lot to deal with. And some of their players can be really, really good in a very organized squad when everyone knows exactly what they're doing. But Teo, for example, he's somebody that just attacks so much that defensively he just irks me so 
much. And if it's not in a perfectly tactically assembled team, his weaknesses become so exposed. So I wonder if it is a lot of the time the way they play is sort of masking the weaknesses they have and trying to, to pull on the collective strength. And when that collective starts to miss key players, it all starts to tumble. Well, what I'm hearing is when I said things to defend Napoli, it was making excuses. But when Mina says things, I'm messing with you. Um, oh, no. I, <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. They, there are no excuses. There are none. Except they're playing in the Champions League and not against Leicester City. So. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I definitely think there's something in the... Um, there's something in, in the absence of, and to be fair, it, it was, it's not just the absence of, because he had lost some form um, even before sort of being missing for this game. But I, I think the early season, the player who was really sort of exciting me a lot was Raphael Leal. And in this sort of current dynamic, um, I feel like the confidence of that early season running that he had, the way he would make those really, really direct runs. I think even if you go and look at, to spin our conversation back to the, the previous segment, that game against Liverpool, where they, for a while, had Liverpool a bit sort of stunned at Anfield. It was the sort of combination of, of sort of such a, a group of young dynamic players who were willing to just run at you. It was him, it was Teo, it was Raheem Diaz all doing it together. And it's always been a slight little bug in my mind that does it completely work when you put Ibrahimovic in it because he wasn't there at the start of the season and, and does that change the way you play? It's not a knock on Ibrahimovic. It's not a knock on what he can do for you. It's just does the, the recipe change and does it still work? And, you know, maybe there's something in that, maybe there isn't. Uh, I definitely think that being in a position of being over-reliant on Ibrahimovic in this current moment feels really uncomfortable to me. He had a pretty nondescript Champions League group stage. I was never perhaps the competition where we saw the very, very best of Ibra in his career, but the fact that he did that and then sure, he scores a brilliant goal here and, and gets you out of trouble. But I wonder if, I don't know, maybe it's just me. I, I want this team to, to not sort of be stuck forever <laughs> clinging to someone who is, who is 40 years old, bluntly. Um, I know that we all want to hold on to the idea of someone brilliant being brilliant forever, but everyone, everyone reaches that point. And I think that even at the end of, for instance, Francesco Totti at Roma, he was still scoring some really important goals, but was it the best thing for the club that he was still there? Well, at some point they decided it wasn't. And I, I wonder if Ibrahimovic, who was so helpful last season, such an important presence I wonder if he's still doing that in the same way that he was. I know I'm being really contrary here because I'm talking about the one player who scored a goal who got them out of trouble this week, but I don't know. It's it's a thought that I've been having. No, I think I, I think these things make a difference and I and I agree with you. And I think there is something to be looked at over there. But I wonder sometimes when we talk about teams like Napoli and Milan, and I'm sure we'll get on to UV, if it's we're expecting too much from these sides that have a lot of obvious flaws to them. Napoli have a great first team, but they don't have the squad depth that can ma perhaps manage with the style of football that they want to play. Milan has a great mentality, but perhaps doesn't have, you know, the, the, the strength or the quality all over the pitch required to compete for the title. You know, it's interesting we say that because obviously Atalanta is always a team that is like scary. And yet you look at their team and you think with the budget that they've had and yet they've managed to produce something so exciting. So it sort of breaks any argument that you may have. But, you know, when you look at Milan, you just think to yourself, I, I mean, you know, we talk about Zlatan, but for me, everything revolves around midfield. Like when I think of why Madrid wins over Inter, I think it's the midfield, right? When they won the derby last yesterday against the Atletico, it's the midfield. It's always the midfield. Inter's midfield makes the difference. Um, and their midfield was Kessie and Benesse at their ultimate best. And Tonali wasn't that great last year. And it was just these two, just, you know, Kessie was winning everything, you know, intercepting everything, tackling everyone, you know, and, and so smart on the ball, perfect clean passes, read everything perfectly. And Benesse next to him, just, you know, doing everything else. And then you look at the season and Kessie is just, 
I don't know, there's something about him that's sort of not really working. And people are saying, is he distracted by contract negotiations? But he's not the player that he was, certainly not even at the start of the season. He has somewhat fallen off when it comes to providing that great presence up in midfield that helped the defense as well, because he shielded so much that they didn't have to be so exposed at the bank. He is like the one man alongside Benacer and always positioning themselves correctly um, to, to cut off passages of play. Benacer as well has not been the player that he was last season. So there has been a reliance on Tonali to pretty much do a lot. And, and I wonder whether, you know, if it's Tonali is not playing, it's pretty much just him because I look around and I think Kessie is not the player that he was. Benacer is not the player that he was. And Bakayoko has been nothing short of a disaster. Krunic is not somebody that I'm going to really rely on. And so this is what I mean by there is a certain dependence on this one man in each department. And if that person is missing, then it just seems to all fall apart. And, and, and I think that with having so much injuries and, and, and so much rotations, there just comes a point where you start missing your guarantees and your understandings of this is what Kessie is going to do. This is how Teo is going to run. This is what I need to block. Um, and you're missing the tactical intelligence of, of, of certain players. So I, I just think they need a better squad if they want to cope with the Scudetto challenge. And, and right now, Inter's just so far ahead of everyone else. Well, you, you named them just now, Mina, and let's move on to them. Juventus also dropping points again this weekend. And I am understanding where you come from because we've talked plenty of times already this season about the lack of quality in that Juventus squad. But you can't tell me with a straight face that you think it's okay for Juventus to be now, as we've also talked about in this podcast, behind Fiorentina, even in the league standings. You can't tell me just because of Dusan Vlaovic that this squad should not be um, should not be ahead of Fiorentina in the league. You just can't. One player is not enough. No, I mean, if, if, this, if the league finishes the way that it finishes, I think that's a great disappointment for Juventus and I'll be super embarrassed by it, you know? Juventus should be doing better. They should be winning against Venezia, um, frankly speaking. And... They have been ab abysmal and abomination. You know, I, I don't even know how they managed to finish, you know, first in their in their Champions League group. But it's amazing, isn't it? I mean, that's so contrary that in the season they're playing this badly. But they, yeah, go, sorry, <laughs> interrupting you. Yeah, they managed to do well in the Champions League. I, I, I get irritated when people blamed Pirlo last season. And I get irritated when people blame Allegri. I don't care. You can say Juventus is the abomination. There's nothing from their football right now that entertains or excites you in any way, shape or form. But I don't know what you want from this team. Like you have to be objective. And I feel like I, Juventus, like Milan, were in the Champions League, are fighting against their reputation more than people are actually looking at Carl Dahl's back. Which is, yeah, cool. They've got a great, you know, they've got Dybala and they've got Locatelli and they've got Bonucci and Chiellini and... And you think, you know, this this should be a good team. But the truth of the matter is, is Dybal is always injured. So he's not somebody to be counted on or, or, or I mean, he's basically non, non, he's not there. He's a non-presence. Locatelli is there, Bonucci is there, but Chiellini is and The rest of the team is pretty average because, you know, your great Federico Chiesa, the man that you're supposed to build this team around, has been injured for quite some time. And so... You know, I, I do find it sometimes like people are like, oh, you know, like, listen with Napoli, like they're missing Osman and they like, just don't expect too much. But somehow with, with Juve, they've got to keep going despite the fact that they have, they just lost Ronaldo. And when Real Madrid lost Ronaldo, they sacked a coach, started falling, got knocked out of the Champions League. But it, it's a huge loss and it needs to be given the respect that it merits. It's a huge loss. Was it keen? or Ken, however he wants, because it, it changed. Uh, he's not the right replacement. He's a good player, and I hope he develops into the very best. But you look at this team up front, and we're basically relying on Keane right now and Morata, and they're not exactly two players that either work well together or work well as, as players alone. They are need to be part of a, of a nice, big trident or, or, or duo, at least or when it comes to Morata, he likes to play off someone. That's why he did so well with Tevez. And that's why he was so good with providing assists to Ronaldo. He likes the reference point. This is a bad team because Arthur's never available in midfield. So you're relying on either Rabio or Benton Cord to, 
to team up alongside Locatelli, who weirdly enough had a bizarrely poor game against Venezia. But again, he's the only midfielder because there's constant injuries. You know, Morata wasn't even available in the first, in the beginning of the season, in, in, you know, against Chelsea, for example. So this isn't Allegri's fault. This is the management's fault. There is fault, absolutely, because if Fiorentina is doing better than you and Empoli is catching up to you, there is fault. You know, you do have a better squad uh, and should have a better mentality. But the fact that you're switching off against Venezia says something. There is something there on a mental level. It's weird when Bernadeschi seems to be your best player at the moment. You know, like what just happened there, you know? Why are there so many injuries? What's going on with Dybala? You know, why is there so many muscle injuries as well? And there are things that I question because he came from Palermo and then put on so much muscle mass straight after. And I wonder whether that had, has had a deep impact on him going forward when it comes to all these injuries. Not too far and not too different to what Coutinho suffered. So there are question marks about the way that certain players have been developed on a physical point of view. The squad isn't great, but I don't think that expectations should be so high. We And I, I am so guilty of this. I saw Allegri's coming back and thought straight away that Juventus was going to win this because I believe so much in this coach. But just like I got so angry when people were talking about Pirlo and I'm saying, look at the squad. He didn't even have Locatelli. He had Ronaldo though, but it's a bad squad. And even if they buy Vlaovic and they bring him in and everything's so perfect, it's not because there's still no midfield that can provide him with the kind of chances he's getting right now. I don't even think there's a player like Sotil that can provide the assist, you know? So I wonder whether he's just going to end up there with like nobody around him because Dival is probably going to be injured. Monat is going to look for some level of leadership and who's providing all these, you know, other than Bonucci, perhaps a long ball forward. There is, this is a squad that, is so unbalanced from in every respect without really much leadership. You lost that with Buffon. You lost that with Ronaldo. You know, you, your Kilini is not on the pitch. So you're relying kind of just pretty much on Bonucci right now. And when Locatelli said, oh, the thing that strikes me differently is that this is a team that really cares about winning. Really, does it? Because... I don't see that. I don't recognize that. And it's interesting because I feel like they lost that when Sadi came. And it's the one thing that Maurizio Sadi talks about so much was that when he was in Napoli, he was so jealous of Juve's winning mentality. And I feel like there's a part of him that believes that winning mentality disappeared when he arrived. And I know that sounds so harsh because it's not like they were brilliant under Allegri in the last season, but each year, a part of that, that character that made them so good has been stripped away. And I don't know if it can be rebuilt. And it certainly cannot re- be rebuilt with, with Bentancur and Arthur, who arrives late to training sessions in midfield. But the squad is bad. And I don't think that we should expect too much of a team that has a lot of injury problems and an already bad squad. Maybe this is just their level. And we should look at them right now as a mid table team. So last pieces of business for this week's episode, Mina, because as always, we've been nattering away and time has rattled on. Um, definitely need to mention that it was the first of this season's Derby de la Lanterna. Um, this one was, you know, this is often one of my sort of low-key favourite games of the season. It's very often, even in recent years, it's been a while since either of these teams has been really fighting for um something sort of really big at the top end of the title, the top end of the table. But these teams really do have like a proper rivalry. It's one of those derby games that certainly when there are fans in the stands that there are now is is a really brilliant atmosphere, a brilliant game. But Genoa are just so dreadful at the moment. We mentioned them earlier as one of the teams that are, are really feeling like they are a bit adrift from the rest of City and in terms of how they're doing, that even against the sort of quite middling Sampdoria side. It was a bit of a, a non-contest, unfortunately. Good win for Sampdoria. I'm certain they all enjoyed it. It was fun seeing Chicho Caputo score and, and jump up on the advertising holdings and do his uh, throwing the beer down celebration. But I don't have, um, I guess, as much to say about this derby as, as I normally would for this game. It's just a sad time, I'm certain, for Genoa fans right now. And this was a bit more um, sadness in a sad neat season for them uh, and what's going on. But undoubtedly a great weekend to be a Samp fan. 
Um, another game that I think we both had our eyes on, Sassuolo against Lazio. Mina, what did you make of this one? I mean, can I just say that I think that was really funny when I read on, on Twitter, somebody said that it's annoying that Genoa's best player is actually the coach. <laughs> when you really need to go, you kind of just wish that they could, they could bring on Shevchenko. Yeah. Poor Shevchenko. <laughs> That's well, uh, I actually had placed a bet on this, tea, on this uh, team because I really, I, I'm not a, like, I don't know what to make of them, to be honest with you, because they're a kind of side that it just seems to be a little bit dull or not at least very interesting to watch against your average sized teams, but against what they seem to think is a big team, you know, um, all of a sudden they bring out the best in Sassuolo, you know? So whether it's obviously Juventus or Lazio, um, they were a lot better. And, and I love the connection that we saw between Berardi and Raspadori. Um, it's almost like the equivalent of finishing each other's sentences. They're finishing off each other's goals. Um, but I do think it's interesting that Empoli is actually ahead of Sassuolo and Dionisi was their coach and now moved to Sassuolo. But defensively, they still got a lot to, to really work on. But when it comes to Lazio, I just, I just want to really ask, like, what is this team? Because I have absolutely no idea. Like when we talk about this is, you know, I mentioned this when I was having my rant about Juventus. This is a side that just seems to be so mentally weak. And that's not something or, or, or a character definition that I would have ever used to have described Latu before, certainly not under Inzaghi. This was the team that even got out of their Champions Group stage last season. Lazio are a fun team to watch. And this is different in the sense that Immobile is obviously not at his best at the moment. Milinkovic Savage wasn't available and neither was Luis Alberto. But... This was a side that started off trying to create chances, then seemed to give up, has conceded 32 goals in 17 games. I don't know whether they're a counter-attacking side or one that wants to have possession and build slowly. I don't know who they are. And frankly speaking, they give up very quickly most of the time mid-game. So I don't even know what the instructions are. And this is what I say to you sometimes, you know, when I associate teams, I think of Napoli as being mentally weak. I think of Lazio being, sorry, Lazio being mentally weak. And I think of Juventus as being mentally weak. And the one thing that I can connect them all to is Maurizio Sarri. So I wonder whether he comes along and does something (laughs) Um, or whether that's me being harsh. But Lazio have so many problems to solve and they are just such a different team to who they were on during Zaghi that I wonder why this coach is so believed in right now for them. I don't know if it's a good fit with what the, Lazio are and who they are as a team and if this is working out so well with them. Yeah, I I have no idea from one week to another with Lazio at the moment. They are a a mystery to me very often. Uh, I am uh, on the other side of that uh, match. I am personally um, very much in in, uh, team Domenico Berardi right now. I'm loving watching him play. I feel like he's just on one at the moment and (laughs) I know that you and Simon, our producer, are a bit more sceptical than I am, but I am I'm, I'm into it. I'm enjoying uh, Domenico Berardi right now. Um, also want to quickly just mention Atalanta winning away to Verona. Um, it's a good win. Verona, as we've seen recently, are no mm. pushovers. Giovanni Simeone scored again. He remains on his incredible tear. Atalanta have been a, it's a huge disappointment, I think, to, certainly to me and, and to you, I think, Mina, from what we talked about before we started the recording today. That they weren't able to get through that Champions League group. Um, they had really those last two games, just so many chances to do better than they did against young boys and against Villarreal in the final game. Obviously, there was some disruption with the game getting rescheduled, but no two ways about it. It's very disappointing. But at the same time, they've won six in a row in the league now, and they're only three points off the top of Serie A. So while well, some things have not been going uh, their way, that's Pretty stinking impressive. Um, we said last week, Gian Piero Gasperini, the manager, has said he will not um, tolerate basically Scudetto conversation until they've been top of the table at least once. And that's fair enough. And very possibly with Inter now in front, they will never go top. But whether or not he wants me to, I'm going to look at that league table and say three points off heading into Christmas. They're part of the conversation for me, whether whether they want to be or not. Um, so definitely um, another mention for Atlanta in their ongoing impressive league form. 
just just shore up the back line. Just shore up that <laughs> back line. They are so open. It's annoying. It's up. Oh, it just it's gross. Just figure it out. Because <laughs> otherwise the team is so good. And I feel like these problems they have at the back just detract and take away from the beauty that can be Atalanta. Because they've never been as uh, open at the back as they have been. And I wonder whether Romero's absence and Bonini makes a difference. You know, not that Musa hasn't pulled off some great saves, but there have been other saves where you're sort of thinking, what, what are you doing there? You know, and Romero was still good in one-on-ones. It's a different way of defending now. So, but at the back, I think they're so tragic that I don't think a team with that kind of defensive record can actually win the title. And that's why I think Gasparini is, you're right. In the sense that, you know, trying to be calm about everything. Even if you believe, Nikki. (laughs) But I think that's pretty much all that we have time for today. I'm a little bit worn out by uh, how disappointing my team is. And by the fact that I'm just annoyed that Inter got Liverpool. I would have liked them to have gone, you know, anybody else, basically. (laughs) But we will be back on Friday with the Chronicles Q&A mailbag show. Get your questions in on Twitter at Seria Cronpod with the hashtag Chronicles Q and A. Find us on Twitter at Nikki Bandini and at Mina Rizuki. And subscribe to the Seria Chronicles YouTube channel for clips of the show. When you see me doing different hairstyles, depending on the question that I have to answer. <laughs> Leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs> and uh We hope to uh, hear from you next week. Ciao for now. Andy in the box for Italy. Di Biagio found that half yard of space from Roberto Baggio's cross and then found the corner. Shorter numbers. This is Christian Vieri, and that's a lovely finish. 2 0 to Italy. Lovely chip as the goalkeeper went down. It's looking easy now for the Italians. Bit of hesitation, and Vieri makes it three. The ten men just couldn't hold on. Mistake by Warme, and a second goal for Vieri. Podcast Network. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered chumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, Mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa. Take it easy, Judy. <laughs> The Chumba Life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.